Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Lisa Mariyama. In our show this time, we'll cover the Think Tech Anthology Downtown Forum called Hawaii State of Hospitality. Are we reaching our limits? This was a luncheon panel program with five expert panelists and a capacity crowd at the Anthology Theater in Bishop Square. Think Tech collaborates with the Anthology Marketing Group on discussions of public interest. And this time, the discussion dealt with Hawaii, the state of hospitality. The program was moderated by our own Jay Fidel, CEO of Think Tech Hawaii, and host of a number of our weekly talk shows on the Think Tech live stream series. The forum was set in the beautiful Anthology Theater, courtesy Anthology Marketing Group and Nathan Cam. Thank you, Anthology. Thank you, Nathan. We had a fabulous panel. One of our panelists was David Carey, President and CEO of Outrigger Enterprises Group. He joined Outrigger in 1986. We also had Allison Schaefers, the Waikiki Bureau Chief for the Honolulu Star Advertiser. She has covered tourism in Hawaii for more than a decade. And Keith Vieira was there. He is the principal of KV & Associates Hospitality Consulting. We had a great talk show to ramp up with him. You can see it on youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. The panel also included Randy Baltimore, Chief Operating Officer of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, the most important state agency there is when you're talking about tourism. Finally, we had Jerry Agrusa, Professor and Chair of Hospitality and Tourism Management in the College of Business Administration at Hawaii Pacific University. We had a great talk show with him also. It's on youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. We asked the audience who they were and whether they were from the hotel industry, the food service industry, the retail industry, the transportation industry, whether they were from government or whether they were students or interested citizens. We also asked the audience what areas they were most interested in. Careers in the industry, investment in the industry, profitability of the industry, risks affecting the industry, what industry can do and what government can do. We seem to be doing okay, if not better than ever in tourism, but the state's economic and social fabric isn't doing that well. We can't afford the projects we want to have, or to fix the roads, house the homeless, or otherwise maintain the social safety net. We don't have the tech industry we've been talking about for so long. Diversified agriculture has gone nowhere. And the post Inoue military presence is at risk. We seem to be in disarray about developing a diversified economy, with protests galore on far too many things. But nobody protests tourism. Everyone recognizes that it is more and more the single most important sector an engine of our state economy. More and more, for the tourists, it's kind of a fairyland. They come to a Waikiki world, a palm court, that's not the real Hawaii. Is that sustainable? Environmental concerns increasingly limit development, including tourism development. The younger generations that might provide labor are retiring, leaving, or otherwise not willing to take jobs in the tourism market. While tourists want to see things out of the routine tourism areas, local people don't particularly want them around and aren't affluent enough to join them in the hotels and are increasingly disinterested in visiting Waikiki. There's a growing divide. Some people say all this is not sustainable, that these sea changes will restrain further growth of the industry. If that's so, can the industry thrive going forward? There are those that say that offshore competition will eat our lunch and that disasters, disturbances, and threats make us very vulnerable. Finally, there are those that say that the problems in our community and the irrefutable degradation of our environment will burn a hole in the paradise people come for, and that that will ultimately degrade the industry. So we need to examine how it really is these days, not only to look at today or this week or this month, but to see the larger trends and global competitions. We need to identify the vulnerabilities and threats. And most important, we need to look at our choices and our options and plan accordingly. That means who does what and when and who pays for it. What about inflation? You know, it's nice to say that average rates are going up, but costs have been going up. So this slide shows, starting way back in 2007, 
Uh, if we took the inflation of the rate from 2007 to today, that represents that black line. Take the red line, that's what happens to Revpar, or revenues in our industry. And so from 2007 to 2013, inflation outpaced Revpar. And inflation basically represents the cost of the business. You know, paying employees, utilities, you know, the whole nine yards. And only in the last, really, two years has the revenues increased faster than the rate of inflation. Why is that important? Because if you don't have revenues growing faster than inflation, eventually the business fails. We have several third generation family in, in our employee base where we've got you know, kids in their 20s and 30s. So it's not entirely, I mean, there haven't been a ton of vacancies in the tourism industry other than in food and beverage. I mean, if you take raw hotels, down front desk, house for convenience, there's very little turnover. Why is it unusual? There's been under 10% turnover, single digit turnover, non-food and beverage positions for more than 15, 20 years. That doesn't happen anywhere else. So there must be doing something right with employees. I believe that the industry hasn't done the best job of, of connecting with our youth in the schools to enlighten them on what hospitality and or tourism jobs look like. Uh, so there's, there, there's on and off adopt a school and things like that. And I can't tell you that I think it's very successful. One of the things we have done lately that's pretty successful in a venture with the business roundtable is we've been bringing teachers from particularly the elementary schools in on an internship basis. And that's been a radically eye-opening experience for them because they had no visibility whatsoever. And so if you think of who are the influencers of our children, it's the teachers. The thing that comes out of today, which jumps out at me, is infrastructure. Uh, you know, I think that, I used to, I always talk about beaches, parks, and bathrooms. Uh, and if you put airports on that list, I think it, what we do here in Hawaii is embarrassing as a public community uh, for our residents and our visitors. And I would absolutely love us to see an investment in those kinds of infrastructures that benefit locals and tourists. In 2010, if you see, they were counting vacation rental, and their methodology showed that they had 6,679 rentals. Now, when they changed the methodology and actually looked at online advertisement for vacation rental, um, in, by the end of 2014, they had said that they had 22,238. When did Kailua become a household name in Japan? Recently. I mean, I, it was really kind of interesting to me, and it sort of shows, you know, just how pervasive this problem has become or issue. I, I don't know if we can necessarily say it's a problem, that's controversial. Some see this as a good thing, some see it as a bad thing. And, you know, there's a lot of arguments for both sides that are really great arguments. But the reality is that the most recent office that HIS, Hawaii, built in Tokyo is dubbed Kailua Weekend, and it's advertising all of Hawaii. Kailua is a household name. It's a brand just like Waikiki. How did that happen? Obama, vacation rental visitors, there you go. <laughs> and homelessness, to some extent, is a capacity issue, too. And it is affecting our visitor industry. Um, so one of the things that, despite all of the great programming that we've got, and all the government efforts, and all the new task force, <coughs> the reality is, and if you look at these little pie charts, um, this information is from the latest homeless point in time count. And it shows that despite all of our efforts, that in 2015, 40% of the homeless um, that we were counting were actually unsheltered homeless on the street. And if you look at it, that pie, the pie charts had grown steadily since 2012. So we were 30%, 32%, 35%, 40%. I think adapt is, is the word that I would leave you with. And, um, adapt means to make something suitable for a new use of purpose, to adjust to new conditions, or to alter or make suitable for the stage. And I would say that, you know, Hawaii is on the world stage, and if we want the world to see all of our dirty laundry, if we don't want them to, we have to adapt to the social dynamics and the capacity pressures that are transforming our destination. And I think, you know, what happens next in terms of homelessness, vacation rentals, or all of these issues, good or bad, is up to us. But in Paris, you won't see any on the chance of these days. The shops uh, will shoot them down with water hoses, go to the train station, go to the airport. So uh, I think the sit line, the point of that being the sit line bill has helped. At least it's moved them out of, you know, when your kids are walking down to McDonald's to get something and worrying about what's going to happen walking past a homeless person or, or the experience. So that's been some benefit. It doesn't solve homelessness, but it gets them out of our economic 
lifeblood and allows commerce to continue. How to develop some type of sports marketing program to go forward. Uh, and when you look at the most underutilized place, and there's a few people that may not agree, but that's the LOA Golf Course. Um, 18 hole golf courses across the U.S. are heavily underutilized. What if that was nine holes, you still had a chance to take care of the, the, old, the old guys that like playing over there in the day and turn those other nine holes into an aquatic center where you have two 50, two 50 meter pools. Uh, all of the national meets for swimming, my son's a swimmer that is held in Hawaii, I'm sorry, that is uh, held, has to be done either up in uh, South Seattle or in Clovis uh, uh, near Fresno uh, because they have two 50 meter pools. We don't have any here. Why don't we have that kind of facility? Not that expensive to do. Why not have four uh, uh, little league fields? Why not have the bowling? Why not have uh, an LA Live type scenario uh, that Don Schultz uh, Entertainment Group has done up there in order to turn Waikiki, I won't say away from the beach, but it's not just about the beach. I would say the word for me is branding. Um, what sets us apart is our unique brand I mean, relative to visitors coming in. And we have to do things that stay on brand. And that ties to infrastructure that David talked about. It ties to not making knee-jerk reactions like every time the count goes down, let's introduce gaming. Um, let's stay the course, understand what made us what we are today, and find ways to make that sustainable, involve the host culture, and understand that that's what sets away apart. The ramifications of, of changes that happen in tourism have tremendous impacts. 165,000 employees or more coming out of the industry. Uh, the amount of tax revenue, which could be anything from one to two billion dollars, depending on how you measure it. All the people, all the interests that are vested in it. And so, uh, that being the case, uh, how could HTA be thought of as anything else but uh, a support uh, mechanism for the entire industry? The hotels, they're driving the industry. The transportation groups are driving the industry. You have a lot of technology that's starting to drive it. But, you know, for HTA, we have this broad mission to not only promote and market tourism, but and this is a statutory mission, so this isn't just we're gonna uh, work on tourism. It includes things about addressing visitor impacts. Whether it's a discussion about homelessness or it is about the environment, these are multi-dimensional problems that cut across a lot of different agencies. Does HTA have some involvement in it? Yes. Uh, HTA actually invests money to address visitor impacts and uh, you know tries to uh, lessen the load on various communities and we look at capacity issues and, and the environmental impacts. We really do need to be able to adapt to changing circumstances and much faster than we ever had in the past. If there's a notion that we can continue to do things the way we've been doing it, that's not even realistic because everything is changing around us. We talk about uh, uh, mac uh, weather changes, you talk about ec macroeconomic changes, you can talk about technology, you can talk about just the demographics and how things are changing. If we can't adapt, i.e. adjust to the changing circumstances and be more resilient to this kind of fluid environment, that's going to be a risk for Hawaii over the long term. With an increased interest in both heritage and culture aspects of Hawaii, there is an opportunity to differentiate our product from other destinations, as I said. And you know, what other ways we could do this is looking at cultural performances, even the dining experience, start integrating more of our Hawaiian food, uh, even giving lectures on local culture and history, and also health and healing. This is a big thing of services. And what we had before uh, the outsiders came here, storytelling, that's how all of the history was told here. And I think that people find that very interesting. Uh, if nurtured properly, uh, heritage and cultural tourism will allow the tourists to leave the region with wonderful memories and, uh, of enjoyment, and with a deeper appreciation for what we have here to help our brand. Yeah, and it will allow the community to speak for itself as well. I think that that's very, very important. And I think the schools have done a very, very good job, you know, uh, with uh, hospitality training. And there's people that have done uh, not just hospitality, but uh, become entrepreneurs. Uh, I have former students that own restaurants and, and, and that have been very successful businessmen. And that, you know, you, you this, these guys used to sleep in the class, and now they're making a lot more money than you. <laughs> but uh, this is just what part of what happened, and I think that well, one of the other good things that we've done is, with the help of HDA, is a thing called Climb High, where we, as uh, undergraduate students, actually work with the high schools, and they're trying to bring them, uh, they have a day where we have them all come to the, uh, the, the convention center, and then they put them into groups, and then they go to visit all the hotels, the high school students, to see that there is a career. 
And you know, one of the things that I always try to share with students, and when I used to be in, I worked for Sheraton here, and I've worked for Marriott and so on, we, we always try to tell them, we are ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. This is a Ritz-Colton theme. We're the same, but our job is to serve them. And if you don't want to serve people, maybe this isn't the, the, the feel for you, but serving people and making them happy is an honorable profession. Uh, the word I always leave with is culture, the Aloha spirit. And not just meaning, uh, I have to agree with David in some aspects, that it's not just the Hawaiian culture, but the culture that we have here in Hawaii. And uh, again, uh, as the other candidate said, uh, being adaptable and looking at answers outside the box. Who would have thought that the yen would be at 125, barrel oil would be at $46. Yet the airlines, they didn't lower their prices. You know, so we, we wouldn't know. And who knows what's over the horizon? Could be a SARS, could be mirrors, could be something else that could damage us. As is often the case, we didn't get to all the questions from the audience, but we're hoping the speakers will come on our talk shows later and we can pursue further discussion of those questions. Stay tuned to Think Tech for more. At the end, we posed questions to the audience and found out what they were thinking. Here are the questions. Question, the future of the industry is most dependent on improving Hawaii infrastructure, providing high-end quality, providing lower prices, providing more interesting attractions, reinforcing global brand, ensuring global transportation. Question, the greatest risk to the industry will come from weather and climate change, war, terrorism, and global economics, transportation issues, homelessness and protest, loss of qualified labor, failure to renew public and private infrastructure, Question, what should we do to attract more local engagement? Improve access to and parking in tourist areas? Build facilities that will attract both tourists and local people? Increase the depth and breadth of Kama'aina rates? Pay higher wages? Hire more local managers? Do more community outreach events and support? Question. What should government do to build the industry? Provide leadership to achieve better standards? Build better airports and transportation facilities? Provide additional incentives, tax and otherwise? Provide additional funds for advertising? Do less and leave growth to the industry itself. Build related industries that will enhance tourism. These were very interesting answers and certainly worthy of further discussion. But one thing is clear. If Hawaii is going to stay on top, we need everybody to be all in, fully informed and fully engaged in the effort to change with changing times. Hopefully that way we can reach our goals on a timely basis before other destinations eat our lunch. And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows on the internet from noon to 5 p.m. on weekday afternoons. And then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long. If you missed a show or you want to replay or share any show, 
They're all archived on demand on YouTube. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and our live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign on to our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. Think Tech has a great new studio at Pioneer Plaza. We invite you to come down, see our studio, be part of our live audience. Contact me, Jay, at thinktechhawaii.com. Be a part of our civic engagement here on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We want to know what you're thinking and how you feel about current issues and events affecting Hawaii. We want you to stay in touch with us and we want to stay in touch with you. Let's think together. On Thursday, October 15th, ThinkTech will join with the Anthology Marketing Group again to present a program called Is It Too Late for Real Estate? at the Anthology Theater in Bishop Square. The program will cover the status and prospects of the real estate industry in Hawaii, and more specifically for local investors in a market that increasingly caters to offshore, deep-pocket buyers of high-end properties, with concomitant effect on prices all over the state. Join us and raise your awareness about the critical changes taking place in Hawaii. Be part of the conversation and sign up to attend on thinktechhawaii.com. And now here's this week's Think Tech Commentary. I'm Donna Blanchard and this is the Think Tech Commentary. I'd like to talk about the lawsuit filed against the city and county of Honolulu over homeless sweeps. The law firm Austin Hunt, Floyd and & Ng and the ACLU of Hawaii Foundation filed a class action lawsuit in federal court alleging that the city violated the United States Constitution when it destroyed personal property belonging to the plaintiffs who are or have been homeless without due process of law. The lawsuit alleges that instead of impounding and storing seized property and giving adequate opportunity to reclaim the items, property seized by the city officials was instead immediately destroyed. The lawsuit also alleges that no notice, receipt, or information regarding how property might be recovered was given to the plaintiffs. The lawsuit seeks to stop the city from violating the plaintiff's constitutional rights, end the practice of destroying personal property without following procedures, and to require the city to pay damages and attorney fees. A press release from the law firm and ACLU stated that in just one unannounced sweep in Kaka'ako, Last year, city officials seized and destroyed the plaintiff's property, including their food, children's toys, prescription medication, and government identification documents. In some cases, entire tents, obviously filled with personal belongings, were thrown into a waiting garbage truck and crushed. It goes on to say that city workers have repeatedly refused to allow property owners to retrieve necessary personal belongings and instead threaten these people with arrest if they interfere the sweep. I live and work downtown. I've ridden my bike around the lake shore in Kaka'ako, heading toward the medical school and along North King Street. Those are two places where you'll find sidewalks covered with homes in the form of tents, tarps, and other human detritus. The first time I rode by this community in Kaka'ako, all of my Chicago girl instincts bristled and told me to move to the center of the road, don't make eye contact, and pedal faster. And if I were in a campground and saw these people in their establishments, or if I'd been in a neighborhood of tiny little cottages set close to the road like this, I would have looked at them. I wouldn't have sped up or pulled away. I would have made eye contact and waved or said hello. I would have treated these people like people. The difference, of course, is obvious. And my instincts are not wrong or bad. I was reacting, as I bet you might have the first time you saw it. I was reacting to something I didn't understand, by the way, I'm not afraid to look now, though eye contact is difficult to come by. A lot of the people living here have become accustomed to living in the margins of society. 
Were you surprised to hear that they had children's toys, medication, and documentation paperwork, just like the rest of us? Me too. But that's it. They are just like the rest of us. Only they're living in a different set of circumstances. They don't have anywhere else to put their medication, birth certificates, and kids' toys. It doesn't make them not human, and it doesn't give us any right to dehumanize them. We are criminalizing them. We cannot dehumanize them. You and I don't know their stories, so we cannot understand them yet. What we can bet is that many, if not all of them, don't want to be living on sidewalks any more than we want them there. There are kids living in these neighborhoods, lots of them. I read somewhere that you should always smile at little children in order to protect the child's belief that the world is good. We got to look at them, recognize them, and smile. What we cannot do is ignore the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments, which prohibit the government from seizing a person's property and destroying it without the process. These are people. They are people. And regardless of what your instincts, thoughts, and heart tell you, at the very least, they deserve due process. I'm Donna Blanchard, and this has been a Think Tech Commentary. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. <music> Okay, Lisa, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Juko Ishii does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or volunteer, a producer or intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech Ohana and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Lisa Mariama. Aloha, everyone. Oh, oh.